Good morning. We are here from the National 4-H Conference and we are here to present uh, information about prescription drug abuse. The average life expectancy of an American is currently 78, whereas the average age of death due to prescription drug abuse is 42. This is a difference of 36 years. Collectively, this adds up to 900,000 years. Every year, America loses 900,000 years of life to prescription drug abuse. The number of teens and youth ages 12 to 25 who are new abusers of prescription painkillers grew from 400,000 in the mid-80s to 2 million in 2000. This means it's five times more prevalent. We are the 70% of teens who use marijuana and also have used prescription stimulants. We are the small 12% that have used only marijuana and abstained from prescription stimulants. We are the 18% of teens who have not used prescription stimulants or marijuana according to a 2006 study. Hello, my name is Johanna Hetzler and I am from the state of Wisconsin. We want to thank you so much for your time um, and having us here. We really appreciate uh, your time and attention to the extreme issue of teenage prescription drug abuse. You saw the numbers and you know the facts. This is a make it or break it situation. Our generation is in danger of, our generation is in danger and we need your help to make a change. Prescription drugs are easily accessible and people do not take drug abuse seriously. Our goal is to have youth combining education and experience to create positive change. You presented us with four questions and we use these as a platform for our roundtable discussions. The questions we will address include what can 4-Hers and other youth do to have an impact on prescription drug abuse? How can youth have a voice on this topic? How can the message of prescription drug abuse be given from youth to youth? And last, how does gender have an effect on prescription drug abuse? Thank you for this opportunity to share what we believe is not working, what we can change, and what we as 4-Hers will do to implement this in our own communities. As you have seen from the statistics presented earlier, that prescription drug abuse is not a small problem. Currently, we believe that it's being addressed as one, and it, it needs to be addressed more, and there needs to be more exposure to the schools. And also, in the assemblies that we have at school, it's normally one speaker in front of a crowd of several, several students. This normally doesn't work because a lot of people would be embarrassed and wouldn't be open to sharing their stories about prescription drug abuse if they had a problem. And we believe that it should be split into smaller groups with more gender specific speakers because males would, are more comfortable speaking to males as females are more comfortable speaking to females. This is also because males and women uh, abuse prescription drugs for different reasons. Women are more prone to use because of psychological distress while men to keep the image of being cool. Um, our generation is uh, striving for perfection at the cost of our health. Um, a clear example of this is one of the members in our group. This individual hung out with the wrong crowd that drank and did drugs. Um, depression was unaware to this person and their family and um, prescriptive Prescription drugs were introduced, and this person became hooked to them. One night, this individual overdosed and um, was unconscious and not breathing for two minutes and was rushed to the hospital and was in a coma for three days and had a trek to. Um, it is a miracle that that person is still with us today. And uh, they said that they wished the information was out there and... Um, they wish they had realized the consequences of prescription drug abuse. We have 
come up with an alternative solution to educating the youth about prescription drug abuse? Uh, we found that teens are the most influential to our peers, and uh, we've seen that peer pressure is really effective in pushing teens towards using drugs and alcohol. So we thought maybe we could turn towards a more positive method of peer pressure and try and push for dissuading the use of these types of drugs. Um, in our schools, we've seen our friends and our classmates start to use drugs, and we've seen it grow over the years. And we usually notice it start around sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So we thought maybe the best time to go into the schools and talk to these kids is around sixth grade. That way, we can get a an earlier uh, influence on them about what we feel is the problem. Francis Bacon once said that knowledge itself is power. And we felt that the youth today, they were informed on drugs and prescription drug abuse, but they don't fully understand the severity of abusing prescription drugs. Prescription drugs can result in harmful and dangerous effects, such as changes in behavior, changes in thought processes, and may even lead to death. What they don't understand is that prescription drug abuse not only will affect their current lives, but may affect their future. Our solution to this problem will be inviting guest speakers to talk to smaller groups of youth. Instead of having a large number gather in group assemblies, we would like for guest speakers to come and share their personal stories, their experiences, and struggles that they had to endure while abusing prescription drugs. Many have very powerful and formal stories that will be influential and beneficial to helping reduce the prescription drug abuse. We feel that by doing so, we are able to create a safe and stable environment that allows the youth to feel comfortable about talking on issues and personal struggles regarding prescription drug abuse. We believe that the youth will be able to grasp a better hold of the message, gain a better understanding, and be informed on the severity of prescription drug abuse. Whether it's through inviting guest speakers, 4-H movements, and meetings in school, we want to be able to spread the awareness, not only nationally, statewide, and locally. These are what we plan to do in hopes to reduce the number of youth members abusing prescription drug abuse and to save the lives of our fellow youth. Through 4-H Conference, this group has appreciated our 4-H experience that helps us to be productive members of society through volunteering and leadership. Each of us has developed a passion to share the dangers of prescription drugs. We want to support and use the programs 4-H has to offer, such as culinary arts, public speaking, citizenship, and stock showing. To keep uh, these activities will fill time that would otherwise be used to try to get prescription drugs. Health Rocks is a program within 4-H that many states have started. It is constantly growing support. It's specifically designed for kids ages 8 to 16 and is making a positive impact on our communities. It instills the value of a healthy lifestyle without the use of tobacco and other drugs. This is an example of how 4-H is positively, positively in creating a change for our youth. When the 16 of us go home that were on this team, we have planned an action plan for us to do. We plan on writing an article to give to our local newspapers and tell them what we learned here, what we experienced, and how we want to help our community on getting the awareness out about prescription drug abuse. We will also like to go talk to our county officials and commissioners and go to town hall meetings and prepare a speech to give to them about everything we've done and what they can do to help us get our program started. And the last step we would like to do is start off in the counties and start a program and do parade marches to get more awareness out and tell people what we're here for and how the youth can get involved. Thank you so much for having us today.
today and giving us the opportunity to share our ideas and solutions for this very important problem. The four questions you asked us to answer brought together a group of diverse teens and created a sanctuary. We are the youth that are combining education and experience to create a positive change. And we would now like to open the floor for questions that you have. A comment, and maybe not so much a question, but um, you know, prescription drug abuse is a major public health problem, and, and your presentation talked a lot about stimulant abuse, prescription stimulant abuse. There's also the, perhaps what, it, what we see as a bigger problem is prescription painkiller abuse. And if there are a few minutes, I'd like to hear more from you about that. Um, you know, I listened to the earlier presentation about, about prevention and issues and ideas. You talked about DARE. DARE program. I mean, you know, I'm a father and, and my kids went through the DARE. I made posters and stuff. And just recently, a year ago, I uh, convened a group of high school students from uh, Massachusetts, Recovery High School in Massachusetts. And we had the same discussion that we're having right now about what works in prevention. They talked about DARE. They said, DARE? Oh, wow, that's silly. We thought that suit for drugs are really excellent. <laughs> and, you know, it's an example of what we tried to do to, to Develop a good program, but maybe the message wasn't get, getting out the right way. While you were talking, I was looking at your poster of Uncle Sam, and it, it says, I, I think it says, uh, I want you to stay sober. And I guess I'm reacting, is that the kind of message that, that teenagers react to these days? Just the guy was staring at me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think that our generation is really very visual, and we've had a lot of people from older generations telling us, and I think that our group has really realized how important it is for us to be very obvious in our stand against drugs. And so I think that, you know, personally, all of us have learned to go back home and make sure that our friends know that that is not an option whatsoever. Um, you guys are talking about how we use social media. I think that that's a very powerful thing, Facebook groups, liking something. Um, YouTube videos, whatever it is. Um, you know, obvious signs, I think that youth really are looking for honesty, and they're looking to hear real stories and real effects. Um, and so, you know, I think that the I want you to stay sober, it's very obvious, and it's very um, powerful, and it sticks in your mind. And I think that's what youth are really looking for, is honesty, um, especially from older generations who have gone through different processes and different struggles, um, even if it's the same substances, you know, it's different. So I think honesty and uh, people who really care enough to work in our lives to tell us what's right. So. Um, I would just like to add to what uh, John said. Um, I believe our generation is very stubborn to listen to what adults have to say to us. So what you need to do is be very up in our face. There's tobacco commercials where they will cut open a brain that has had cancer. That I remember. It obviously had an effect on me. I mean, it's, it makes people squirm, but it makes people listen. Do you have any other questions? Sorry, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, I was just wondering, with part of your strategy, there is a National Prescription Drug Take Back Day, and I was wondering if there was a way that you could incorporate that day as part of your strategy to really focus on something tangible that your community could do as an action for a day. Okay, I'm going to let Brady take that one. There is many ways we can take back to our community and have programs. And the National Take Back Day, we could have, because there are 16 of us here from 16 different states. So that's 16 communities we can affect immediately while we're there. We can take back what we've learned here and have programs in our community. Like, just have a fun day. We have the fun day based around prescription drug abuse or the prevention of any kind of drug abuse and just get the word out and just have a fun day like with the Health Rocks curriculum that I work with. The way we introduce the programs, we don't introduce saying, hey, you're learning about prescription drug abuse. We show them in fun activities and they learn it as they're going into the program 
And finally, at the end, they realize, I am learning about this, but they go away with something fun that made them pay attention. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Yes? I also wanted to ask about messages that target parents. I think parents are relatively clueless in a lot of ways around prescription drugs, or either they're bad role models themselves, or else they're uh, not aware of what might be happening with their young people. So I just wondered if you could comment on that a little bit and what you think is effective way to reach parents so they can be direct and honest with their kids, or if it's not a parent, what are, who are the other key adults that can bring this message? In my personal experience, I found that Parents tend to help on a case-by-case -case basis because, like you even said, some parents aren't the greatest role models. Some are great role models, but sometimes the kids simply won't listen. Um, for On the adult side, we do like to have adults in our lives that can help guide us, but again, it's more of a case-by-case -case thing. Um, I think what we mainly focused on was getting the youth to talk to the youth, since if I'm in a classroom, and let's say if I was in my health class, we're hearing the teacher talk about all the bad side effects of the drugs and what they can do to you, but we never really get to talk to each other alone. It's more of, unless you're talking to your small group of friends and you have people that are like talking about what they like are afraid and what's happening and what their friends are doing, it doesn't really exist. So, like what we were trying to propose was having high school students talk to either other high school or middle school students because we can kind of open up more with each other. Like myself, I don't open up very much at home at all. Like in classes, I kind of just joke around a lot. But when I got here, I started talking to everybody and opening up and letting my personal views come out. And it kind of helps to open up when you're with your peers, um, especially in small group settings. Like there's 16 of us, maybe if there'd been like half the conference or a couple hundred of us, I probably wouldn't have said a word. So, does that answer your question? Thank you. Thanks. Next question. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea, and I guess my question would be, what can we do to facilitate that kind of conversation to happen at the youth level, and what kind of information do you need? What kind of, what gets through to, um, to young people, and, and uh, do, do young people, especially the young people who, who are using um, prescription drugs and, and drinking, um, you know, how, how do they feel about these materials? Do they trust them? If they don't, what don't they trust about them? You know, how can we make them more, uh, to, better so they can facilitate those kinds of conversations that you're, uh, you're, you're describing? Brittany's really good at these questions. I'm a lot of yeah. Okay, if I understood your question correctly, at my school, we have on Fridays where we're asked to go into this room, and it's just about 40 youth, but we split into small groups, and then there's just one adult facilitator in there who is in there, and they're there to back you up if you need help. But the groups just talk, and basically I would say the adult support that's needed is if the kids want to talk to an adult, be there to back them up and be like, I'm going to be here to stand with you all the way, I'm not going to get mad at you. Because some kids don't want to go to their parents and, or adults and be like, I'm doing this because they know it's not right. And they know if they do tell you that they're probably going to get in trouble. And so it's just a matter of telling them, I'm going to help you get through it. And, but you are going to have to suffer the consequences. But I'm going to help you get through it without being mad at you. So the adults just need to be there and be there to support us. And the information, you could probably just present some information to some youth to be able to help push it through to them. Is that Yeah, that, that's great. And I, I think um, someone over here had something to say as well. So, um, you can. Thank you. Okay, so we were talking about positive peer pressure in the presentation. And we have the greatest facilitator ever. Her name is Carly. And I just wanted to point that out. She's so energetic and young with us, and we feel comfortable around her. And we had Miss Melinda come in, and Carly, before she came in, she made sure everyone was comfortable with her coming in because some of our peers, we don't like.
enjoying talking and sharing with adults what we do. So talking with peers and young people can have such an effect. And when you share, it like lifts everything off your shoulders and you feel so much lighter and happier. So if we can take that from the high school kids and put that into the middle school kids, what we learned here at 4-H conference, I think we would have so many other kids that don't do these mistakes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Any other questions? Lark's getting up, so I was getting nervous. <laughs> I have one question, and that is, within your states or within your communities, have you done an actual assessment as to why kids are using prescription drugs? You mentioned gender differences. I was wondering if there was any other reason that you are seeing within your communities why there's an increase in prescription drug use. I'll add up to you. I think one part of it is that it's very easily accessible. Um, I know that in my community, uh, people don't see prescription drugs as dangerous because they're right from a doctor. And I think that, you know, you're asking about parents, I think that parents don't see the problem as big as it is, and they don't know what kids are talking about in school and what comes home. And so I know it's very easy accessible, so I think that's one part of it. Also, it hasn't been until my senior year this year that I have actually been informed about um, prescription drugs as being used improperly and being uh, bad for your health. I mean, you assume that kids will just know this because, you know, it's drugs, but some kids don't know this. They take, you know, too many of these and they don't understand the consequences until it's too late. And it definitely the biggest problem is how easily accessible they are. They just open their medicine cabinet, they pop a couple of the pills and no one knows the wiser. Um, just a story to add to that also, I personally had a friend who was had bronchitis and he would go to, a, he was 18, he would go to a doctor and get prescribed promethazine. He would go to another doctor because he was 18, he didn't need his parent permission, and you have your own rights to your medical records not to be released, and he would just go from doctor to doctor to doctor because he had money to blow, and he would just get prescribed the medication. He, did, he could have bought it on the street, but no, he wanted to do it that way. And it just shows um, failure in the system, that how easy from a doctor that teens can get it. Um, I think the biggest issue with why teens choose to use prescription drugs is because it's a lot of stress that teens are under during this period, during this age, through middle school and through high school. And the biggest thing is a lot of times you feel like some of their adults or their parents don't understand them. So when they come and talk to other youth and other peers about it, they're able to open up and tell, you know, what's going on in their community, you know, how they're feeling. They're able, it's a release almost from the stress that's going on. So if you take a teenager, who is dealing with all this stress and they feel like their parents or their adults don't understand them, then I think that's why they opt to go into prescription drug abuse to release that stress that they're going through. I had a questionable thought in my mind. What I was thinking about when you were talking about gender differences is that females might tend to use prescription drugs to get thinner Males might use it for performance enhancing, not that females wouldn't. I don't mean to stereotype. And the other thing is to avoid the smell, because if you've been drinking or smoking marijuana, we can smell you. That was my big parental radar, <laughs> is wake me up so I can smell your breath. Um, and so I was wondering if you had done any local assessments within your community, or if you could do them via a focus group. And having been a high school teacher, when you talk about adults, I had a lot of my students share a lot of things with me, some things I didn't want to hear. Um, but I think if you can talk to an adult who doesn't control your curfew or your car keys or <laughs> your, your room and board, um, I think that's very helpful, and especially, as you mentioned, if they're open. So my kind of challenge to you is to go back and see if you can do an assessment as to getting to the reason why.
because that will help guide you in what you're trying to accomplish. Thank you. I'm sure we can add that into our implementation and our actions afterwards. Um, any other questions? Yes. I wanted to. I wanted to ask you go back a little bit to uh, I forget the exact name of the program, but healthy. Health rocks. Health rocks. Health rocks. Health rocks. Health rocks. Health rocks yep. Right. And just just this idea, which uh, I really resonate with, in terms of really focusing on positive activities, positive um, self-esteem, just the promotional aspects of youth development at all ages. And um, what what are your thoughts? How easy is it to to find that? And what, how can we um, focus on creating these environments and opportunities for young people so that it's not just a don't do message, it's also a message of, of um, here's how you can reduce stress, here's how you can feel good. Jenna is actually on Health Rock, so I'll have to talk to you about that. Yeah. Um, definitely something that I've done with Health Rocks is even though it's a 4-H program, I've worked into getting into my local school's elementary school after school program because I really like to work with younger kids with it and teach them early on how dangerous it is. But also a new curriculum that's just come out with Health Rocks is aimed at ages 12 to 16. So while the younger ages may not have, may have reacted to that, it also gives a little bit more seriousness for those older kids while also still being able to have fun. And I think that programs like Health Rocks are just great because, yes, they have activities, but those activities show them just how serious these problems are today. So, I mean, the Health Ro Rocks program is great, and I think it's becoming more and more widespread throughout the United States. Thank you. Any other questions? May I make a comment? Yes. This is Abby. Yes, my name is Abby. Um, going back to your question earlier about why people do it, there are so many people from different walks of life. I don't think there can be one specific answer. Because I have, in my county, very small community, but huge drug problems. And all, every single one of my friends that I know of, that I've talked to, why they did it, have a completely different reason. One only uses when he's very stressed, and that's his release, that's his safe place. He tells me, this pill is my sanctuary, basically. This is my escape. That's his stress relief. And another friend of mine says that she does it because her friends do it. It's just very, very different reasons. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. Did you guys have anything else to add? Right. We also would want to thank you again for letting us come and share our ideas and support for this. Um, we have some thank you cards for you guys. And again, just this is a really great experience for us. We learned a lot and we appreciate everything that SANS is doing for the youth. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, I want to um, thank you all for coming. I want to thank our SAMHSA staff also. Um, they have put aside time today 
And actually, most of them, I think, have to go. We, we said to 11, there are some of us who can stay around and ask, uh, answer other questions you may have about our agency. Um, but I, I think, and Suzanne, I really want to thank you for allowing us to be part of your <laughs> briefing yeah. schedule. Uh, Larp is the person who helped us put all this together, so I'd like to thank you also. Well, um, <laughs> and, and I think we look at you all, I mean, you're, you're incredible presenters, pulling this information together, uh, putting it with really personal and, and compelling stories also. Uh, I think we will look at you as kind of leaders and ambassadors to help us carry our messages forward into your communities. In your packet, you have ways to reach us, you have information, you have materials that you can either download from our site or order free from us for use in your own communities. And as you go forward, and maybe Suzanne and I can be in touch, you know, to see what kinds of things do you set up that 4-H structure on the prevention for underage drinking. Is that a, a network and infrastructure that we can further partner with you on? Because we don't have a structure like that. So it would be great for us to know how that works and what we can learn from that and what we can do to help support that. Um, we um, have, I took down quite a bit of notes and maybe you need to even review some of the materials we put out. Maybe we're doing things that really aren't reaching youth in the right way. Or maybe you can speak to adults in ways that we also can't given your own personal lived experiences. So I want to just open it up to you all now if you have any questions for any of um, our SAMHSA staff about what we do here or what you, what you might want to know about us that you don't know about us, or, or if you have no questions, we can just sort of get up and, and go around. <laughs> so, I also want to let the SAMHSA staff, I so much appreciate your time, and I know it's more interesting to sit and speak with you than go do your work. So if you need if you need to leave to get back to work, that's fine. <laughs> okay. So yes, I, um, I just wanted to say, uh, announce something real quickly. Um, I have here we have right now going on the PSA video contest. It's targeting 18 to 25 year olds. However, you could get involved. The the due date is April 15th, but you can get it. And it's coming up, and I think we might extend it. But please look at challenge.gov slash SAMHSA. If you uh, can get with a team and you have someone who's 18 or older or uh, 21 for a chaperone, uh, the, the winning team will go to Indianapolis for our, our National Association of uh, so, uh, <laughs> National Alcohol and Substance Abuse Directors meeting in Indianapolis. Four, four people from the team will go, and also your video will be shown at the DEA exhibit, which is going to Florida, and, and will be in Florida for 18 months, so you'll get to have some exposure down there. And if you have any questions, you, there's contact information on uh, challenge.gov, SAMHSA. I also want to say real quickly, for the group on underage drinking, when you were talking about working with your states and your regional and your local offices, we, if you're not aware, each state has what's called a national uh, a prevention network representative, NPNs as we call them, and so uh, it would be really important to contact your state NPN because they could help you coordinate any activities you did with underage drinking, also prescription drug, drug abuse. Uh, she used to be one. So, I'm a recovering Indian, and it's north. No, 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 I'm sorry. Um, I also wanted to say along that lines, we work with the Drug-Free Communities Program, which is out of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. If you go to the ONDCP website, they have a map, and they will show you where these drug-free community coalitions are, and they would love to hear from you. I've always liked the fact that County Extension and indeed um, 4-H are, are in every county in North Dakota, I know that. Um, and I assume that every state, I was surprised that they were in all of the states because I refer a lot of my drug-free communities people to that. You mentioned um, working on this one team to another team at a time. The Drug-Free Communities and the Sober Truth on Preventing Underage Drinking Laws Act works on environmental strategies, which is changing laws and policies, curfews, those types of things, so that 
rather than, if we're sitting in this room and you're cold, I can run and get you a coat. And I can run and get you a coat. Or I can go over and turn up the thermostat. Environmental strategies focus on turning up the thermostat in your community so it will impact all of the people in the community. You mentioned inconsistencies in policies. There's another website out there called the APIS. It is the Alcohol Policy Information System. Steve Wing's ICPUD group, his interagency group, publishes a um, report to Congress every year. In the back of that report, if we can ever get it out of OMB clearance, um, there's a listing of 18 laws that affect servers, that affect youth, that affect driving. And it tells you what the law is in your state. And it's a good place to start if you're going to work with your NPN or try and get some policy changes made. Community problems are best solved at the community level. As I looked at your ages, you're probably planning where you're going to college and what you're going to be. One of the first documents I saw when I started this, 20s and old, um, I'm not that old, <laughs> uh, was a book called Prevention is Everybody's Business. Prevention is not just parents' business. It's not just youth, youth to youth business. It's businesses, it's healthcare professionals, it's faith-based communities. I want you to think about what profession you're going into and how in that pro pro profession you can make an impact on your community. Drug-free communities demands by act of Congress that 12 sectors of the community, including media, youth, parents, faith-based communities, come together and have a discussion, build a coalition around what to do in your community. And so sometimes you need to look beyond law enforcement, beyond the school, and see who in your community touches you in the course of the day and how that impacts your decision. Another place I want you to look, I'm sorry, Lark, is <laughs> John Underwood you know, is... You know, I'm wondering if you can put this in an email sure. to me that I can send over to Suzanne. Yeah. so that she can get all these, because I think you're bringing up really good, important resources and information, and then she can send them out. You were talking about positive yeah. messages. We were in a huge, huge room, and this young man got up and said, quit, quit punishing us, and quit telling us you can't do this, and stop doing that. Form it in a positive message. John Underwood has come out. We can do as adults, as parents, as professionals, as much as we can to protect you. Well, we can't stand beside you when somebody passes you that joint. That's your decision. John Underwood has a series of brain scans. He talks about if an athlete goes out on a binge drink, they are not up to peak performance. He's an Olympic trainer. They're not up to peak performance for two weeks after that binge drinking. So if they get caught and are suspended, they might as well sit on the bench anyway. But that might help you making your individual decisions about what you put into your bodies. And I love your Health Rocks idea. I think that's fantastic. And I love the work that you're doing, and I love that you're everywhere. And come in. Thanks very much. So do you all have any questions for us? We're just about nearly done, that we're near close to 11.30. Any, any? Yes, sure. I actually chose the drug and alcohol awareness for the alcohol portion, but you know, I'm actually so glad I got with Carly and her group on prescription drug abuse because alcohol affected my life. My dad was killed by a drunk driver and I was really passionate about that. But your questions and how we came together and we discussed them, and I really looked back and I realized prescription drug abuse is such a big problem. And I'm really glad I got the opportunity to, you know, with the, my other 4 Hers in this group, to make a difference. And we're going to go back to all of our counties and share what we've learned and everything. And it's awesome. And, you know, Sam said just what you're doing, it, it's great. And I just hope to stay involved throughout everything. So thank you again. Great. Thanks for that comment. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Um, I kind of just want to add to what Anna Joy just said. I just want to thank all of you guys um, for, I guess, just sitting there and allowing us to talk to you instead of, you know, us coming up here and, you know, doing like a school project. We actually, you know, felt engaged with you and I really appreciate, you know, all y'all's enthusiasm and interest in these topics that, you know, we're so passionate about. And um, 
So that being said, once again, thank you so much. And um, also, Drew, thank you. You've been such a great help to us, and we really enjoyed having you once again. So, And Carly, too. So, <laughs> um, But anyways, once again, thank you. We really do appreciate it. So. Thanks very much. Okay, so any other close and Santa folks, any other closing comments? Um, so I, I think we will.